So the role of futures work and by application of futurists by some degree yeah. is about saying, how do you practice a potential future? Right. And then how do you create strategies for that? Um, I think there's there's a lot of scope around the merging and the convergence of medical healthcare and technology, yeah. all the way from biotech to nanobots to CRISPR. I think that's a huge frontier. I'd rather have questions that can't be answered than answers that can't be questioned, right? <laughs> and the same thing holds true. Look at ChatGBT, right? We, we've done this. Yeah, everyone's done this. They've Googled something and you're like, this is the dumbest thing ever. This, this stupid machine has given us a terrible answer yeah. because the question was wrong. Good afternoon and welcome to IT Web TV. My name is Chris Treasure. With me in the studio today, I have Craig Wing. He's a futurist and an internationally recognized keynote speaker. Thanks for being here, Craig. Appreciate yeah, how's it, Chris? Thanks very, very much for having me. I really appreciate it. Yeah. So, uh, Craig, I think the the first question to you is, is what is a futurist? Yeah, you know, it's an interesting, Chris. I, I get asked this often when I go to conferences and presentations, etc. I actually don't like the term, right? Um, okay. Yeah, and, and there's a few reasons why. So let me tell you what a futurist is not, and right. then we'll get down to what a futurist okay. is, right? So, so, so by and large, people, the perception is a futurist is someone who can tell the future, right? So I can I can do some navel gazing, I can look into my crystal ball, etc. Sure. No one can tell you what the future is, right? But by implication, because the title futurist or futurologist or any of those things, yeah. the connotation is you can tell the future, right? Yeah. And explicitly you cannot, right? right. So, so a futurist is not someone who can go there and and say, listen, you need to you need to bet on this technology. You need to do this, you need to do that. So let me give an example of, of that, right? Yeah. So r right now, the world is in a very strange place. We've come out of COVID, there's sure. wars, you know, there's the, there's the Akram VUCA, which we can dig into deeper. Yes. But the world is changing very quickly. Yes. And as a result of which, many corporations and organizations are saying, look, you know, I want some surety. I want to know where's the world going and where I back things, right? Right. A prime example of where it goes wrong by saying, this is what the future is going to be, is uh, Facebook, right? Really? So, so a prime example exactly. is last yeah. year. So Facebook, as sure. you know, went and changed the name from Facebook to Meta. Yes. And they sank literally one third of their market cap into exploring the metaverse, right? Now, if you're an organization and you put one third of your value of your organization into technology that fails, you're going to be out. Right? Yes. And that's the problem of a traditional connotation of a futurist that can tell you what's going to happen. So that's what a futurist is not. Right. What a futurist is supposed to be, in my view, right? Yeah. And the academic literature shows us as well. Um, is someone who actually goes and says, how do we ensure that your future is more robust? So how do we get you to think through multiple permutations of what the future may be, as opposed to a singular future where you bet your house on it, if, you, if, if that's the right acronym, right? right? But rather, how do we think about what the future may be? How do we consider that future? And how do we ensure that we make the best possible decisions to ensure your strategy, your company, your organization is robust to meet many multiple futures? So would it be accurate to say that Instead of actually thinking that you're you're predicting the future, you're actually just prepping and empowering the individual to meet head on whatever comes their way in the future. Absolutely, absolutely. Right. So that's that's a great example. Let me let me give you an example that's um that's pretty not it's pretty appropriate right now. So right. um Afcon, right? So so South yes. Africa. I assume many of the viewers here are from South Africa. Maybe they're from across the continent, sure. right? But here's a prime example of why the role of a futurist and what I'm talking about is important. So here's the analogy. Bafana, Bafana, South Africa, right? South African national team, we're playing soccer, we've made it the next round right now, right? That's right. But any sport, almost anything that you have, there's a realm of practice, yes. right? So the, the, the football guys, Bafana, Bafana, Banyana, Banyana, if you're the ladies team, but irrespective, you go and you practice. We'll practice taking penalties, corners, set pieces, defensive line, this is how you shoot. All that stuff, they practice before the actual match. So when the match takes place, They've got the drills. They've got the understanding. We know how to do this because we've practiced before, right? So right. makes a lot of sense, right? It Obviously, does. sure. But the issue is, think about organizations. Do you practice what the future is going to be? You don't, right? It's no. insanity. It's like saying, okay, you want to play some soccer? Here's some football boots. Now we're going to go play Tunisia tomorrow. You'll be like, right. that is insanity. I don't even know how to kick a ball. Right. But somehow within the world of business, that's what we expect. So the role of futures work and by implication of futurists by some degree yeah. is about saying, how do you practice a potential future? Right. And then how do you create strategies for that, right? So it's not about the prediction of we're going to do this and that's how yeah. the game is going to play. Yes. If the future unfolds this way, yes. these are the things we need to do to be considered for it. 
So it's simulation and testing to make sure that you're adequately prepared for whatever scenario may come your way. Absolutely. So you've used a couple of things over there. Simulation, right? So yeah. simulation, uh, that may be all the way from wargaming. Yeah. So I was saying, what does the future look like? How do we play that out with our competitors? Sure. How do I put myself under stress? Uh, scenarios. Prime example, when people think about the future and future space, future thinking, they tend to think about scenarios. What does a scenario will look like, right? Yes. Um, they play those things out. Um, Clem Santa, great futurist, a great thinker. Yes. Uh, in South Africa, is probably one of the most well-known ones, right? But even the the art, the role, the science of futures thinking and strategy and scenario planning specifically has been around since the 1940s, probably even earlier. I mean, it's it's implicit, right? I, I make the joke often, um, you know, there's two things we know is certain in life, right? It's it's death and taxes, right? right. Now, taxes, you know, we're a country where maybe taxes are not guaranteed, so maybe you don't pay your taxes. Yeah. And death, certainly, well, it's certainly, a, it's going to happen, but yeah. maybe we're just extending it out. Yes. The other thing that happens to us is the future happens to us. It right. happens to us all the time. So implicitly, human nature is we think about the future. Yes. And we do it and we dream about it from our personal perspective. Right. What if I get that job? What if I marry that person? What if I, I go live in a different country? Right. But somehow, from a corporate perspective and organizationally, we don't do it. Yes. We go, there's a singular future. That's what it is. Yeah. That's, you know, this is fascinating. And it brings me to my next question, which is, you are going to be uh, in the lineup. You're scheduled to deliver a keynote at the IT Web GRC yeah. uh, 2024 at the Forum in Bryanston. That's on the 20th of February. Uh, without giving too much away, is there? Can you just give us a, a bit of information about what what delegates could expect? Yeah. So, so, so based on what I just said right now, to a certain degree, right, the future is not determined. So it's not. It's 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 indeterministic. It's it's multiplicitous, which means that. It's not predetermined, and there's many kinds of potential futures, right? That's on the one side of the spectrum. So it's infinite possibilities. On the other hand, there's a singular future where a lot of organizations say, let's extrapolate our past, and then by extension, we can use it and say, that's a predictor of where the future is going to be, right? So right. we do this in many, many respects. Uh, things like GDP growth, economic forecast. We do these things like uh, revenue sales, right? We do the thing with child, child growth. But we also tend to extrapolate the past and the future as a proxy for what we think it's going to be. Right. And that's not necessarily the case. Think about COVID, right? Exactly. And how that was on the radar for 99% of organizations yeah. and it completely changed plans, changed trajectories, right? right? So the keynote is about saying, how do we find a balance between the singular future, a multiple future, and based off my PhD research, how do we think about the world in a different framing? And therefore, how do you find a way to do a GRC governance, regulation, and compliance work within that framework to be prepared for different kinds of futures. So it's like the okay. practice of football kind of thing, right? With you. How do you practice With the future you. from a GRC point of view? Excellent. Well, that's going to be very interesting, I'm sure. Um, but, you know, we, we could c carry on talking about all sorts of uh, concepts and information. Sure. The GRC is huge, and there's many issues that we need to discuss and we can discuss. But I think it's important just for those viewers out there who may not know who Craig Wing is, could you just give us an uh, overview of your career, how you've landed up to this point? Yeah, sure, Chris. I mean, so first of all, the disclaimer is if you do Google me, please don't click on the Australian rugby player. <laughs> it's, oh, is this? Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. Wow. Okay. So, so the funny backstory with that is is there's an Australian rugby player by the same name, Craig Wing, right? right. Um, and he actually would have made his debut for Japan. Um, not in this World Cup, uh, the one that we won, you know, not the one around the France. I was there, by the way. So oh. not the one in France, not the one before that. The one that was in South Africa, I think it was, right? Oh, right. Um, and he would have made his debut against South Africa. And he would have been the oldest ever rugby World Cup debutant, right? Sure. But he was injured in the warm-up before that game. So don't click on him. So, so just, just as, a, <laughs> that, as a funny side story. That's a story. fair warning. That's good. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, so for myself, you know, uh, who am I? Well, you know, um, geez, what's the best way to put this? Well, at least on paper, you know, I'm an engineer. Uh, a qualified electrical engineer, I did my master's in usability interfaces. I went to the US. Um, I studied there. Uh, I studied at, 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 at a place called Babson College, um, which is known around the world as the number one entrepreneurial MBA. Wow. Uh, US Times and News has ranked the number one for the last like 45 years. So it's sure. all right. Um, did that, worked at a couple of companies. I started six companies along the way. Uh, I'm working on another one right now. I start up using um, artificial intelligence sentiment analysis. It's based on my research. Right? Um, and along the way, also, uh, I've worked at Google. So I worked at Google as the head of small business marketing there, um, there for a number of years. Um, but yeah, I know it's been a very journey. And uh, so, you know, it, it's it's all these different things that Steve Jobs says the best. You know, he says, you know, mm -hmm. the dots the dots only connect when you look backwards. Yeah. So from that perspective, you know, I've done a number of different things, entrepreneurship, worked at Google, 
got two I've got two provisional patents. I had two provisional patents for one to my name. Um, from the work from the future space, I'm lucky enough to have traveled around the world. I think I crossed country number 51 recently. Wow. Yeah, it does some cool stuff. Um, and yeah, I work with organizations, um, organizations all the way from, you know, whether you want to call it the S&P 500, uh, you know, the biggest companies in the world, uh, advised governments. Uh, I did work for Nigeria, digital scenarios. What does the future look like from a digitization point of view? Consulted the United Nations, did some stuff for BRICS, all the way cool. through to nonprofits. Uh, in South Africa, boards are a couple of companies over here. Um, yeah, and then um, in addition to those other degrees, I'm doing my PhD, uh, which I'm hopefully going to be finishing off right now. So, you know, you, if you check it, like the scandals that are be coming through right now, it may not register that it's done, but I'm at the last part. So, yeah. Yo, I mean, that's incredible. You know, a, a lot of people um, would, would just hear, hearing this, be, you know, be absolutely astounded, you know. I mean, it's just such a full, you. full, um, you know, um, it's an incredible career so far. Thank you. you know? Yeah, thanks, Chris. I mean, it's just one of those things, right? It's, it's, it really is. And I guess, I guess, tying this back to the theme of the futures, the futures piece, right? I mean, in terms of futures, yes. It, it, a lot of this is, is it's not planned. Uh, it really isn't, right? I mean, and there's a. So I'm writing a book. I'm writing a book around the research between everything, else. between everything else. You know, when I've got so much time, right? Um, and and one of the things that I, I write about in the book is this concept called a, a drunkard's walk, right? A drunkard, a, dr- a drunkard. So you know, oh, when you drink and all kinds. Of, oh, and, yeah, and, the, yeah. and the concept's pretty simple, right? The concept is 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 uh, maybe in South Africa, but certainly overseas when you can walk, uh, walk all cities, right? The concept is uh, you drink, you get you get you know drunk off your feet, all that kind of stuff, yeah. um, and then somewhere along the line you decide, okay, fine, you, you kind of don't remember. What's happening, right? And so we might go to another bar. We might go to uh, go to a friend's place. Maybe we'll go out. We don't know. Maybe we'll go out for dinner. I don't know. But the, the, the journey kind of just carries on. Right. The cha- but what's interesting is the next morning you wake up at home. And that's kind of like the drunkard's walk, right? So so we go and life happens to us along the way. Right. We don't plan for it. But somehow we always find our way home, right? And that's Which, kind of like the concept around this. And everyone's got the story, their own personal story, right? So sure. you can retrofit the dots like Steve Jobs said. Right. But the point is, though, is along the way, you just make decisions. And things happen. And then it just kind of goes the way it should do. Sure. Interesting enough, within that story, within that space of a book, um, there's two other big things. And this is really interesting. Is is often, often we make and we plan for a lot of things that are actually small in terms of the outcomes or the impact on our life, right? So give me an example. You overplanned for the weekend away. You overplanned for dinner. This is the reservations where we're going to go, this is where we're going to wear, this is where we're going to eat, the holiday, where we're we going to go, right? Book accommodation, activities, right. etc. And you overplan for those things, which are cool and they're fun, but they're not instrumental in terms of life shaping events. The big life shaping events are actually the things that you don't plan for, like the drunkards walk, like you know, the big night out and we end up going to this crazy party, or you know, if you're overseas or maybe here, you climb pl- on a plane yeah. and you fly to Vegas, whatever the hell it is, right? Like the movies, right? Right. But Often the big decisions, you can't plan for them, they just kind of happen. You don't plan to meet your significant other when you go out that night or you go to a friend's party, right? Sure. You don't necessarily plan for that job, that dream career. It's through someone else that says, hey, I know someone that's looking for this kind of role. Would you be interested in it, right? right? You don't always find the dream house. You're just going through the newspaper, you drive through an area and you go, oh, geez, I'd love to live here. Yeah. And so that's the other concept of the drunkard's walk is the first one is you you don't plan for everything. Life just happens. But also yeah. sometimes the big events, you can't plan for. They just happen. Oh, it's, it's incredible the way you describe it. I mean, um, I guess it's about being at the right place at the right time as well. And and whether you b- believe in fate or not. But speaking of things that we, we can't isolate or cement, um, what is your view of Gen AI? Gen AI. Uh, I mean, it, it was a big thing last year. It's a big thing this year. Where, where do you think it's going? Generative AI, generative AI is, is fascinating, right? So, so, so if you look at Gartner's hype curve, which I know many of, of, of the, the viewers and listeners may be, may be, may be aware of, if you don't know, uh, just Google Gartner's, Gartner's hype curve. Essentially, it's a, it's a curve that goes up like that and then it drops down. Uh, it's, it reaches a peak. Oh, a peak yes. of inflation, then it drops down to trough of disillusionment, oh, right. and then it goes back up and it curves up, right? Yes. Generative AI, based off the research done by Gartner around artificial intelligence last year, says that Gen AI is at the peak, at the absolute peak of hype, right? So it's at the absolute most. People are making a lot of deals about it. It's a big thing. Right. And I get it. I mean, you know, uh, ChatGPT was released, what, in November of 22? Yeah. Uh, around about the October, November of, of 22, right? So um, why that's interesting is because of how mainstream and accessible it's been, right? Um, OpenAI, the company that developed 
ChatGPT has been around for, I think it's 10 years, maybe even 15 years. It's been around for a while, right? right? But it's only reached mainstream adoption or rather, maybe not adoption, accessibility in the last couple of years. So I think there's a lot of, I'm not going to say it's overhyped. Um, I think there is a degree where people are saying we can use it for all use cases and that's not exactly the case, right? right. Why, where do I think it is? Um, to understand that, I think you need to understand a little more around around what powers generative AI, right? Right. Uh, and so I'll simplify it to a certain degree, right? A, a lot of generative AI is based off large language models, right? Right. Um, within the back end of these generative AIs and uh, GPTs, which a general pre-trained transformer, right? right? Essentially what it is, it takes a lot of data in, the data gets tagged, right? It gets tokenized. Right. Then there's essentially a, a process of taking this tokenization, trying to do some algorithms and matching the outcome of the next piece uh, in terms of text, shall we say? I'll talk about the I'll talk about the graphic shortly, right? Sure. But in terms of text, there's a matching around saying, what is the next likely word in the sentence of the question that you've asked, given the context of that question, right? So, so let me give you a stupid example. Uh, a stupid example would be if you go to Google search engine into the homepage, and you type in how to make. The box drops down, and you have other entries, right? right. How to make a cup of coffee. How right. to make tea how to make plans for my wedding, yeah. how to da, 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 all that kind of stuff. Those autocomplete sentences, those things are based essentially off an algorithm on the back end that has curated and said, this is what you're most likely going to be asking based off what other people have said and based off your customized research history. Right. What that then means is if you have a look at it from a definition point of view, and LLM, which is powering that system, which powers a lot of other things like like a generative AI and chat GPT, yeah. then, then is going and saying, What's the most likely answer you want to get? What are you most likely searching for? What's the most likely next word in the sentence? Sure. What's the most likely truth, not the absolute truth? Right. No. Sure. So, so I think there's a there's a there's a lot of misconception over here, and you, you see this all the way from all the way from technology experts, um, you know, the likes of Musk's of this world and Zuckerberg's and all that kind of stuff, right. who have different views. On the one end, you've got sure. you've got uh, the utility. The guys like Zach, who there's an incredible amount of utility, it can fix all of our problems, right? Sure. Uh, same camp as Diamandis, uh, right? Um, on the other side, you've got the guys like Elon Musk saying, it's the the devil in the machine, we've we've released this, all that kind of stuff, right? Yep. With respect to, to both of those camps, they're not expert in AI, and so they don't necessarily know what's going on. But even right. more than that, we also got to be cognizant of what's the bias, why are they saying certain things? They're all involved in AI, and are they driving folks a certain way, yes. right? You hear this all the way from futurist can tell you this is what the future is uh, and you see these things coming out in articles so many jobs are going to be replaced by artificial intelligence general you know intelligence we can chat about that also about sure. why that's not the case yeah. the point is uh, above all of this kind of thing my view around gen ai is it's a tool it's a tool that you choose how you're going to use it the studies already show that if you use generative ai productivity can be increased by 16 percent now, to understand why it's 16% and to whom it applies, again, it comes down to that example or that phrase that I said where AI gives you the most likely truth, not the truth. Right? Right. So just picture a bell curve distribution. Bell curve distribution, right? And it's not an absolute, it's an indicator of what this is. Right. Gen AI and AI to a certain degree based off the algorithms and how it gets programmed essentially gives you the, the, the mean and one standard deviation across from the mean. So it's sta standard bell curve distribution, Gaussian right. distribution, one normal distribution away from that, right? So one sigma across from that, it'll probably give you that answer because that's the most likely truth, not the yes, truth. The right? truth, right. That truth, right? So now if you're starting out in a certain job, I'm uh, I'm new to the world of, I don't know, uh, plot, pot planting, or I'm, I'm, I'm a new gardener, right? Right. Use things like ChatGPT to understand the basics of gardening. Right. It bumps you up to that average because it gives you the most like truth. So it gives you the most, the most obvious, most normative answer. Right. That's the bump that you see. When you go a step further, it's not just 16% that you can give productivity, but it's higher amongst folks that have never used or are new to an era. So if you're a graduate, we know we've got issues around job placements and sure. education, all that kind of stuff, right? Yeah. But if you're new to a certain era, like a new graduate, use ChatGPT to get you up to the normal, the average, and they see bumps there of about up to 34%. So almost sure. over a third by using generative AI. And that's all the assumption that the tool is being used for the right reasons or yeah. the uh, positive reasons, uh, you know, but just as much as it can be used 
positively, it can be used negatively, and we we see that, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, so 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 Richard Feynman, a uh, great physicist, think all that kind of stuff, right? He he's got this great saying. He says, "I'd rather have questions that can't be answered than answers that can't be questioned." Right? <laughs> and the same thing holds true. Look at ChatGPT, right? We, we've done this. Yeah, everyone's done this. They've Googled something, and you're like, "This is the dumbest thing ever." This this stupid machine has given us a terrible answer yeah. because the question was wrong. <laughs> so, so part of where we're going, and we might talk about this around what comes next, right? But yeah. it, it's it's essentially it's about asking the right kind of question. I think the world has moved on between b- beyond having the right answer and having the answer all the time to saying what are we asking? What's the right question? Not what's the right answer. Sure. And yeah. then to your point. Like a tool, we can use Gen AI, we can use any tool. Fire is inherently both good and bad. Right. You can use it to burn down a kingdom, you can use it to burn down Rome, right? But you can also use it to warm your cold body to yeah. cook food. Exactly. So it's got multiple uses and it's up to whoever's using it, how they want to use it and what the ramifications are going to be. Yeah. 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 And, and to tie the theme of GRC, I think that's exactly the point, right? So, yeah. so how do you create, and within the realm of Generative AI and AI in general, bearing in mind the field of AI is, is 60, 70 years old, probably even more, right? depending on how you look yeah. at it. Um, it it's, it's the role of, of regulators, governance, compliance folks to actually say, how do we ensure this doesn't run away too much? Yeah. Right? Therein lies part of the challenge, though, because folks that operate in these industries often uh, put in processes, legislation, rules that are based on precedents i.e. what's come before, how do we understand that, therefore how do we then make rules moving forward. Right. This area and many of the technologies and the world we're moving into in the future space, there is no precedence, there is no playbook. Then the question becomes, how do you do GRC in a future, in a world where there is no precedence? Yeah. And, and, and that's what must be keeping a lot of business leaders awake at Absolutely. from a GRC point of view. Yeah. Because what's going to happen? And they have to be ahead of it anyway. Um, know it and be ahead of it at the same time. Yeah, I mean, I, I, yeah. I'll give you another prime example. Right? So I lecture around the world, et cetera, right? Yeah. Um, I did some lecturing to, to, to a European bank, a gigantic European bank. And part of that is we spoke around, you know, obviously generative AI, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but more specifically, the role of deep fakes, oh, yeah. right, within that realm. And now you think about the, the, the problem if you're a bank and you get fooled by a deep fake. Uh, I mean, they're, they're coming through now. I mean, we know this already. Uh, you know, this is this election year for us in South Africa and many other countries around the world. I think it's exactly, yeah. 70 countries as as per the IEC. Right. Right. Um, but the role of, of deep fakes and generative AI around creating false news, we haven't even touched it yet. Uh, there was one that I saw in, in the US. I'm not too sure it was. Maybe it was Iowa. Uh, but there's a robo, robo calling uh, where it's, it's fake and it's... Um, it's encouraging people to not vote for Biden, to vote for Trump, right? So there was one over there. Wow. There was another one that was released also two weeks ago, uh, the World Economic Forum. We, we know that's going on right now. Yeah. Uh, you know, there was a there was a video, a, a deep fake around the Argentinian president. And he talks and, and he's talking about, you know, the ills of the Western world and how it's consumerism and we need to be careful. We need to find our own way, right? And it looks legit. And what they've done is there was actually three AIs going on in the background, right? They used one to take legitimate footage, actual footage of the Argentinian president, so it's legit. Yeah. They then used one AI to do uh, to change the shape of his of his mouth, wow. right? To lip sync to English. The English was a version of him speaking English that was then rectified to sound like him, right? And the last one was to ensure there was lighting angles, et cetera, but it was real footage. And it's a three minute talk and it looks exactly like that. So I came back to the bank and I said, uh, from a GRC point of view, and it's not some crazy thing, it's a real example today, right? right. How do you safeguard yourself today when, and it's a true story, when if you're the CFO, you get a phone call from the CEO on your mobile, it's his number. You pick it up, it's his voice. His voice says, Chris, it's Craig. I mean, obviously, you know who I am, the CEO, right? now. I say, uh, I've just emailed you. You need to release a payment for $10 million to this organization because we need to close the deal. We need to procure stuff, whatever the case may be. And rightly so, you're the CFO and you go, Craig, we can't do that. We've got compliance checks in place yeah. because we're a legitimate listed organization. We have to have controls. We need to have three levels of sign-off. And we need at least 72 hours of notice. And I turn around and I say to you, check your email. You go into your email, you check it's there, right? It's from me, it's from my email address, it's from the domain name, it's got my signature, everything, right? And I say to you, Chris, you either release the payment yeah. or I'll find someone that will. Yeah. What are you going to do? Then what are you going to do? And it just so happens, this is, and this story is based on a real story, the CFO signs off, it ends up being fraud, et cetera. So now sure. the question is, what do you do when it all seems legit? It's the right number, Right voice, 
on the computer, email, all and, those things. And you tick the, the checklist, right? You checklist. Tick everything. Yeah. And then you go a step further and you say, well, let's double verify. Let's turn on FaceTime yeah. or Zoom or Microsoft. And on the back end, you've got what I just said to you with the Argentina thing. Sure. And it's yeah. me saying, it's me. I told you, release this damn payment. Yeah. You know, and how do you get out of that? I mean, there's no, there's no quick fire solution here. You know, you, 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 you try to keep up with what's going on from a technology point of view, but like you've just said, deep fakes, it's all happening and it's being inter intertwined with social media and everything yeah. else. So we're living in a very, very interesting yeah. time, I guess. Yeah, it's absolutely. You know? I mean, you know, that's a, that's a, that's the Chinese saying, right? May you live in interesting times. But yeah. I mean, the, the answer from, from technologists will be, yeah, but we'll just program an AI to detect other AIs, right? And, and determine what's going on. Yeah. That's a problem. That's like drug testing in sport, yeah. right? So, so, I mean, that's the easy answer because yeah. when you do drug testing in sport, you're only testing for the drugs that you know are available today. Yeah. And that's, that's got a lag period. Yes. Right. So now so, we're creating an AI for stuff that we don't even know to the marketplace right now. You always play catch up. Yeah. It's, in, it's incredible if you think about it, really. I'd like to ask just another question in terms of what you think um, is going to happen soon from a technology point of view. What, where are we going? Any any um, technologies that are up and coming, really interesting that, that you know, business leaders really need to make sure that they are aware of and yeah. keep a lookout for. Yeah. So, 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 I mean, this is, this is counter to what I said before, you know, around, around the futures telling you, pick on this, pick on this, but right. Yeah. But so, so this is more trend. This, these are trends trend. that we see, right? Sure. But this might be a far art trend. This might, in fact, this isn't a far art trend. This is a signal of things, right? Right. Um, so, so some of the stuff that I see coming across the board is stuff like quantum computing. I think that's right. got a huge potential around of really accelerating processing speed, et cetera, uh, doing models, trying to understand how do you do things around yeah. um, new material design. How do you understand DNA folding? How do you even do climate change modeling differently, right? So I think there's a lot of scope around that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, I think there's there's a lot of scope around the merging and the convergence of medical healthcare and technology, yeah. all the way from biotech to nanobots to CRISPR. I think that's a huge frontier, right? As we, we can see this already, when you have a look at both lifespan and health span, lifespan being how long we live, health span being how healthy we are. Right. So nobody wants to live to be 100 years old, but the last 30 years is terrible, right? So <laughs> how do you live well as well? I think that's an emerging area. I think the whole realm of health tech is emerging. Yeah. A lot of stuff around that. Um, I hope it accelerates a little bit more, but edutech, I think, is really important education. Yes. Only because education, by and large, has failed us. We are current education systems around the world, not just in South Africa, are based off industrial age mindset. It's about production line. It's about conveyor belt, right? Yeah. So I hope you can that. I think the biggest thing, though, that is a wrapper for all of this, and this ties into this whole question of what comes next, yeah. is, is you, you know the definition, on, or you, we've heard about the fourth industrial revolution, right? So right. phrase uh, that was coined by Charles Schwab, the World Economic Forum, which he says it's the, it's the convergence of, of, of technology, specifically the merging of the physical, digital, and biological realms. Right? Right. What I think is a big thing that comes off this is essentially the cognitive, cognitive humanitarian, if you will, uh, age of internet or, or the age of age of the fifth industrial revolution, right? Which yeah. is where humans and machines work together to actually accelerate our humanness. And I think you'll see that more and more. Uh, and there's, uh, yeah, the reason is is for every for every for every big thing, there's a counter thing. Yeah. There always is, right? Yeah. That's that's how things happen. Sure. So right now, there's a big driver for disruptive technology, uh, and there's a misnomer. People say things like, you know, we have to move towards a platform. We have to get rid of we have to get rid of friction in the system. We need to move towards elasticity. Uh, on demand, what are they essentially saying? And that's why I'm also I'm also wary of speakers and consultants and experts to say this kind of stuff, because they don't consider the unintended consequences. Essentially, what they're saying is they're saying get rid of the human being, get rid of them, because the human being is by implication of friction points. Yep. But we see even before COVID, but specifically through COVID, we see this is what happens when you don't have human interaction. Yep. Uh, mental health disease goes up. You know, we've got issues around depression, suicide, all that kind of stuff. Productivity swamps, it uh, drops. Yep. We've got issues with kids, all that kind of thing, right? Yeah. So the counter to that, and I think I really do, I think it's the augmentation of humans with technology, not from a chip point of view, but it's how do we augment humans' ability with technology to become better human beings? I mean, that's, that really does sum it up very well. Um, it's, it's about understanding the technology, but also not, lo not losing your humanity, your humanness, exactly. right? So if that's the way it's going to go, I think it, 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 there's some big things ahead of us that we can look forward to. That's the hope, right? I mean, Chris, I mean, ultimately, the, the, challenge, the challenge with that is, is it's the values that underpin that. Uh, and unfortunately, unfortunately, a lot of businesses specifically are driven by a shareholder and a profit, mo profit motive. 
Right. Now, please, I'm not saying I'm a socialist or any of that kind of stuff, right? And I, and I believe in capitalism because for me, it's the metric system. Right. But the challenge is when you chase capitalism all expenses, this question becomes answered very quickly from a cost equation point of view. And the right. cost equation is this. It's when, it's when the cap the capex cost, the capital cost of technology becomes less than the opex of human beings. Sure. You replace the human beings with technology. Right. And you replace the human being, right? And, and in that context, you know, I was in Japan at the end of last year. Um, I, I really like I really like what the Japanese said. They say if the work can be done by a machine, it's disrespectful to give it to a human being. Sure. And you think about Japan and what they've gone through. You know, they were a close aside for 150 years, yeah. uh, 17 to 1800s. Then the World War came through. You know, decimated them, uh, and they rebuilt the entire economy around the premise of saying, well, how do we ensure that humans are the center of everything we do? Yes. We'll augment that with technology. And right. now they've got, I think it's the fourth or fifth biggest GDP, uh, low unemployment rates. Uh, you know, the unintended consequences of that are still like, you know, a uh, low birth replacement rate. But sure. the point is, from a technology point of view, it's about augmenting the humanness and being more human, not less human. Yeah. Well, Craig, I think it's been fantastic to speak to you. It's been really insightful and I really appreciate your time. Thank you very much. And uh, once again, the viewers can see you uh, at the GRC event 20, on the 20th of February. Um, but Thanks again for, for making the time. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Chris. No, thank you very much for having me. I appreciate it. Thank you. Oh, your pleasure. Thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, please subscribe to our channel for more uh, exciting stories. Have a great day further.